serves as a member of the parliament in Uganda. He is, like you, not just one thing, but also a number of things in his life. He is also a businessman, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a freedom fighter, and an actor. But apart from all these things, he is also a musician, and his name is known by the name of Bobby Wire, which is good, this is why we don't have to sing the song, but Bobby is going to do that for us and introduce himself further by sharing a song with us on stage. Please give him a really big round of applause. Welcome, Bobby. Si 
and last lap because it's my form of communication and everything that I say, I say as a musician. Have you always been playing music? Is this something that you just grew up with and decided that you want to do at an early age? Yeah, I was born to a music family and uh, I was not the most talented in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share the same with you. I also come from a family of musicians and I'm the father of these talents. Sure, sure. And indeed, my kind of music, uh, I adopted it not just um, for the beauty of music, not to become a celebrity, but to use it as a mode of communication. You have very political and educational lyrics. So have you always seen the power of music as a as this tool, as this door opener, perhaps all sorts of topics in your society are otherwise difficult to address? Yeah, but not from the beginning. Just like any other musician, I started out as an excited young man, and my initial lyrics were about the girls, about the beer, and about the parties. But um, along the way, when I realized that my music was influencing the young people so much in the negative way, I decided to reach out it and make it and change it from entertainment to entertainment. And that is why I started changing my lyrics and. Uh, started influencing young people positively. How does that work? How was that adapted? Did you have a status of popularity before so that when you started singing educational songs and lyrics with more political content that your fans sort of adapted to it? Or is that just something that generally works? I think here it'd be quite difficult to break as a pop music act with an educational um, goal. Well, I actually think that the real revolutionary lyrics um, connected me more with the people. These are things that were happening every day in society. And uh, singing about them was just reflecting what's happening out there and people felt so re represented. Um, and somehow, you know, um, my revolutionary lyrics made me actually even more popular than the casual lyrics. So what are the kind of things that you sing about? Well, um, Initially, um, at the start of uh, the rechanneling of my lyrics, I talked about behavior change, a song about tolerance, a song about sanitation, and most importantly, a song about HIV AIDS, because that was the most affecting with people of my um, age. But of course, the more I grew up, is the more my eyes opened uh, to the realities, and I noticed that uh, most of our problems were actually emanating from bad governance, so I started advocating for better governance. When was the point where you felt music isn't enough and you decided that you need to become politically active in other ways? Well, that was uh, 2016. All along I had just been playing my music, um, 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 I mean, playing my role through my music, but um, after um, the 2016, um, elections back home, and uh, I noticed um, from the uh, population point of view there was a lot of uh, apathy, there was a lot of disconnection, especially with the young people, the way they are being governed. I, yes, I've been advocating for young people to get actively involved, but I realized that it was much better to demonstrate than to explicate. So I took a dive into elected politics um, to play a more practical role and to get a more formal platform, but also to inspire other young people to get actively involved. And here we are. And here we are, exactly. So you became a member of parliament and you sort of started being a politician. How was that, like your musical popularity must have helped to, and must have helped also just to deal with exposure and kind of things that you experience. But how has, yeah, how has actually being in the sort of business of doing day-to-day -day politics as an MP become you? Um, what can I say? Um, initially, I never ever wanted to call myself a politician because unlike here back home, the word politician or politics kind of lost credibility right. uh, because of the behavior of uh, most of our leaders. So I many times called myself a leader and not a politician, but again, not to confuse words and not to, um, to add argument, I always accept whoever calls me a politician, I do. Um, 
they are the same things that I was saying as the musicians that I say as a leader or as a politician, if you want. Only that uh, the response is now much more harsher than when I was singing. So it must feel, I'm just assuming this, kind of lonely sometimes because I'm guessing that you spend a lot of times in rooms with people who are thinking not like you and who are probably of a different generation to you and would like to keep their power in their control of your country and you're trying to change that. Sure, but again, on the contrary, I don't believe so much in boardroom politics and I'm not a boardroom politician. Um, I'm this kind of person that wants to reach out to the common people, first and foremost, connect them to the, uh, the, their country and uh, remind them of their responsibility. And indeed, um, yeah, I relate so much with people, those that um, are like-minded and those are, that are different-minded. But my concern mainly is with the population and not with the uh, leaders. I think it's an interesting point. I just want to bring Iyad in for a minute because I, I watched um, a talk that you gave last year at the Oslo Freedom Forum when you were speaking about Arab societies and the demography of Arab societies today and how they're mostly made up by young people who are better educated than ever before and have more access to the internet than ever before but are just held back by their regimes. Can you just give a little nutshell of your theory in that talk? Uh, well, yeah, of course, it's a fact, it's not a theory. But I do want to comment about something Bobby said about you know politician, the word politician having lost, uh, you know, lost credibility. And I remember well, before, uh, I mean, I lived in the United Arab Emirates until like, 2014. So before moving to Norway, or before being moved to Norway, um, and it's not it's not the worst country. You know? I, I went I went from the like okay, both of both countries are oil rich. But then one of them is like number 150 something down the list in the democracy index, and the other is number one in the democracy index. So I won the lottery when it comes to, you know, comes to companies, right? But I, was, I would regularly tweet that I'd rather be a bathroom attendant than a politician. I mean, I'd rather be a garbage man than a politician. It just seemed like, you know, uh, you, like the word politician just has lost so much credibility. It's become associated with corruption and, and, and nepotism. Uh, so I, I definitely relate to that. But at the same time, if you're not in politics, then you cannot achieve the change that you want. And that's, well, that's something that I, I've struggled with for, for several years. But coming back to your point, the fact is that um, Arab societies have been running faster than Arab regimes. I mean, uh, social realities have changed drastically in the last you know, 40 or 50 years. But then the social norms, especially the political norms, have not changed. An example of that, I would take the case of women, for example, right? So we're hearing a lot about Saudi women activists who are being persecuted and you know, tortured, etc., by the current Saudi uh, uh, government. In the 1950s, Saudi women, the number of the, the percentage of Saudi women who could read and write was probably less than 5%. And in some areas, probably less than 1%. 90, like basically over 95% of all women in the country were completely uneducated. Now we fast forward to, to now, and the fact is that women are as educated as men. If you look at people below the age of 24, the liter literacy rate is nearly 100%. Uh, and that gap has actually reversed in such a way that women are actually uh, getting higher grades at school and completing more, uh, more uh, years of education. So imagine a situation where 1950s, most women are uneducated, etc., and you say, oh, that's why you need a male guardian. And imagine now, when you're the most educated woman in the country, and you need a male guardian. It just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. It seemed to me that when I was listening to uh, Iyad's talk, and I was thinking about us meeting him on stage today, that there are a lot of parallels. Uganda being a country that is also mostly a young population, and on the few occasions that I had the honor of visiting, a country that seemed extremely open and extremely vibrant and full of young people wanting to do really great stuff for the country. A lot of them with technology, but also a lot of them in different areas. And then the stone old government that's holding everybody back, basically. Well, um, I like to say that that actually is happening. Um, some of us were born in a Uganda that was a little bit freer Mm -hmm. than it was that it is today, and the space is constantly being closed. 
For example, yes, uh, you mentioned Uganda is one of the young, actually the second youngest country in the world with a population of over 80% under the age of 35. There's so much internet usage and uh, these young people, um, the um, literacy levels might not be too high, but they're pretty high. So these young people connect a great lot and uh, the regime back in Uganda has been so threatened that uh, um, in the recent um, months there's been a, a closure of space. You must have noticed that the internet has been attacked so much. Um, um, today, to use the internet in Uganda, one has to pay a tax of 200 shillings every day. That's right. You introduced, Uganda introduced this internet tax, social media tax, where the rest of the world was like, what? <laughs> Why would you do that? Um, I have people trying to work creating di di digital solutions and seeing that as a future economic force for the country who feel completely set back. How does the government get away with this if so many of the constituents are so young and believe in something else? Well, our government gets away with it because it feels it doesn't have to explain to anybody. Even when um, recently it was uh, written by the Guardian that more than two million people had uh, been knocked off the internet in Uganda. And not only that, I mean, any way that uh, young people communicate has been um, seriously attacked. Talk about the arts. Um, besides uh, uh, critical lyrics and critical music being um, abolished, for example, my concerts um, abolished in the country and uh, so yeah, I would, let's talk about that some more because I read, so other politicians, if they're successful with their work, they might get like a library or a street named after them. You will have a regulation that's being named after you. I read that the Uganda government is proposing this legislation requiring artists to register with the ministry to submit their work for approval and also submit their work for documentation. And it's of course giving a lot of reasons why it's doing this, but basically it is to do with stifling voices very much as yours, which is why this regulation is known as the Bobby Wire regulation, correct? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the regulations are actually, that bill is uh, nicknamed the anti-Bobby Wine bill. And uh, according to his proposals, um, the artists will have to submit uh, their, their scripts um, of their creative work, be it plays, movies, or songs to the minister for approval. Where the minister doesn't like, you don't sing it, or you don't act it. And as if that's not enough, it will require even me, uh, if that laws passed, for me to come here and speak to you, I will have to get clearance from the minister back home. That is not how it was, but that is how it is now. So the situation is tensing. Um, it's tensing in the sense that there's less room for digital freedoms and less room for creative freedoms. This regulation, if I read correctly, was just introduced a few months ago, basically, um, to take hold. You are doing everything humanly possible. <laughs> it is one person to go up against this. Um, but, but it doesn't seem to be enough, right? How are you trying, apart from with your music, and with, like, what's your sort of in this situation, your recipe for the next couple of steps for mobilizing more people to do similar work to you? Well, for starters, I want to correct you that it's not one person against the regime. I'm only a representation of millions and millions of young men and women back home in Uganda and indeed on the continent that are so stubborn with uh, freely expressing themselves. So on, on a positive side, regardless of all these uh, guidings, um, the young people of Uganda have been so creative that they've even inspired the older people to follow suit. Um, somehow we get to communicate. Um, the presence of social media in the NIF is being blocked. I mean, it's a great platform uh, for us. There is, um, yeah, some young people using VPN and 